Hi everyone! The last three videos in this series have been devoted to the subject of gravity, and in this video we're going to finish off that topic. So far we've looked at gravity as a force, and whenever you say that gravity is a force, some flat earther is going to say, you stupid globetards can't even keep your lies consistent. One moment gravity is a force, and the next it's something else. It's wibbly-wobbly, space-timey, curving mumbo-jumbo stuff. Uh, yeah, we need to set the record straight. Is gravity a force or isn't it? This is Flurf Pratt. Flat Earth points refuted a thousand times. If you liked the video, thumb it up, subscribe, and hit the bell. Before we continue, this video is sponsored by Atlas VPN. VPN stands for Virtual Privacy Network. A program encrypts your data and sends it through your ISP encrypted to a server that then talks to other computers on your behalf. This means that you don't leak any personal information. The computer on the other end doesn't even get your IP address. This prevents website operators from storing and even sharing information about your surfing habits. Hey, now you wait a minute right there, you dumb globetard son of a bitch. Are, are you saying this'll make it so NASA can't track my ass on the internet? Yeah, sure. In addition to protecting your privacy, Atlas VPN lets you connect through servers in many parts of the world, allowing you to bypass regional restrictions. You mean I can watch a video NASA banned in my country? Yeah, sure. And since your ISP can't see what you're doing, they can't throttle your bandwidth because you're streaming, playing games, or downloading big files. So they can't turn off my internet? If I Google for something that NASA don't want me to know about? Um, right. So what's this here VPN thing gonna cost me? Right now, if you sign up for the big deal, it's only $1.83 a month, and you get an extra three months free. And that's for an unlimited number of devices. But this offer won't last forever, so click the link in the description while you can. Well, that sounds great! Yeehaw! Bertha, get my wallet! Okay, now we can continue. Is gravity a force? The answer is that in classical Newtonian mechanics, anything that makes bodies with mass accelerate is a force, because force is mass times acceleration. So, yes, gravity is a force. But Newtonian mechanics is not the end-all, be-all of physics. While it's good enough for most engineering applications, there are situations, especially in astrophysics, where a more accurate model of gravity is required. Einstein's general theory of relativity. That's what we're going to talk about in this video. The subject of general relativity, the modern theory of gravity, is a mathematically complicated one, and most people don't know anything about it. But indeed in it, gravity is not considered a force, but a pseudo-force, much like centrifugal force or the Coriolis force, produced by the curvature of space-time. But what the hell does that even mean? Well, that's what I want to try to explain. And before you say, yes, I know that no flat earther will be willing or able to follow this. This isn't for them. This series is meant to help those who want to understand how we know that flurfs are wrong. And I suspect that most people watching videos debunking flurf stupidity actually don't know what it means for space-time to be curved. Just like flurfs don't understand what it means for the Earth to be curved. The difference is that the former is perfectly understandable and perfectly justified ignorance of an advanced topic, whereas the latter is enriched weapons-grade stupid. What general relativity is really all about is writing laws of physics so that they are the same in all frames of reference. Newtonian mechanics describes gravity as a force, the strength of which is proportional to the mass of the affected body. This means that since the total force on a body is also proportional to its mass, mass cancels out and all bodies are accelerated equally by it. This is not the case with, say, the electromagnetic force, for which the acceleration depends on the affected body's charge to mass ratio. That leads to something very interesting. Alice and Bob are both in spaceships. They're sealed in and can't see what's going on outside the ships. Alice drops a ball and watches it fall to the floor, accelerating at 1g. Now here's the question. Is she landed on Earth, or is her ship accelerating up at 1g? As far as any physics experiment performed aboard the spaceship is concerned, 
there is no difference between those two seemingly very different situations. So why do we use different physics to describe them? Is Alice an inertial observer, one that is not accelerating, at rest on the ground in Earth's gravitational field, or is she an accelerating, non-inertial observer? Now let's look at Bob. Bob drops his ball and watches it float in front of him. No force acts on the ball and it does nothing, so to him, it appears that he is an inertial observer. Newton's first law clearly applies. The ball isn't affected by any force and it's not accelerating. Well, what if his ship is falling freely in a gravitational field? Then the ball and the ship will both fall with the same acceleration, so he'd be a non-inertial observer with no way of knowing it. Here's what Einstein figured. We are so accustomed to being in Earth's gravitational field that we treat this as the norm. It's not. Such strong gravitational fields only really exist near celestial bodies of significant mass. And if you look at all of space, that's clearly the exception, not the rule. So let's not use our expectations. And let's not use common sense. Let's use the empirically observable facts to determine if Alice and Bob are inertial observers or not. Well, Newton's first law clearly applies in Bob's frame, but not in Alice's. So let's define a freely falling observer, one following gravity, as being an inertial observer. And let's use that as a starting point for finding a way to write the laws of physics so that they are the same in all frames of reference, inertial or otherwise. This means something very important regarding gravity. In Alice's frame, assuming she is indeed at rest on the ground, if we describe physics consistently, we should choose to say that the ground is accelerating her up and the ball is only affected by a pseudo-force. That is, gravity is not actually a force. But how the hell can we say that the ground is accelerating up? Obviously that's ridiculous. I mean, it's so stupid some flat earthers say it. Well, suspend judgment for just a little longer because we're about to explain this. We're gonna get to the key of general relativity curved space-time. Let's put Alice at a safe distance from Earth where its gravitational influence is negligible, and let's have Bob fall freely in Earth's gravitational field. Bob defines his frame of reference so that his z-axis is pointing directly away from Earth. He gently lets go of a ball and notices that it floats right there in front of him. We plot the ball's z-coordinate over time and see that we end up with a straight line, the same z-coordinate at all times. This is a straight line through space-time. Not space, mind you. In Bob's frame, the ball doesn't move through space at all, but it's a straight line through space-time. According to Alice, on the other hand, the ball accelerates down toward Earth. Her ZT diagram of the situation, even if she borrows Bob's Z-axis, would look different. A downward parabolic trajectory. A curve. Of course, again, this is a curve through space-time, representing accelerated motion. According to Alice, the ball moves in a straight line through space. How do we reconcile these two different perspectives? Can we turn a straight line into a curve or vice versa? Well, yes, we can. We can draw a straight line in a curved coordinate system. The stronger gravity is, the more we have to curve Bob's t-axis, because the more curved the trajectory will be, according to Alice. A straight line is the shortest path between two points. It's also the path an object follows when it's not affected by any forces. It's the curvature of Bob's coordinate system that allows it to function as an inertial frame. When seen from Alice's perspective, the curve she observes is the equivalent of a straight line in curved, that is, non-Euclidean, space. This is analogous to how what appears to be a straight line to a person walking on the Earth's surface is actually a curved path when seen on a globe instead. This is because the Earth's surface is curved, it's non-Euclidean. The general term for the equivalent of a straight line in any shape of a space is geodesic. The ball follows a geodesic in Bob's frame. 
In Alice's frame, that geodesic no longer appears as a straight line because she's outside the curved region. She's looking at the globe. She's not walking on the ground. Hi. Hi. I, I got me one of them Atlas VPN things. It really was just one eighty-three a month with the big deal. And I got me three months free extra for free. So here's what we've covered so far. A generalized version of Newton's first law would not say that an object moves along a straight line. That only works in flat, Euclidean, that is uncurved spacetime. Instead, it says that an object moves along a geodesic until acted upon by a force. The direction of the geodesic is what is determined by gravity. So gravity is not a force. It is the shape, the geometry of spacetime mass, or rather energy density if you want to get technical, warp space-time, altering its shape, and this makes it look like matter attracts matter. As John Wheeler famously put it, matter tells space-time how to curve, space-time tells matter how to move. So let's get back to that thing I said about the ground accelerating Alice up. Here, space-time is telling Alice's body how to move. Accelerate toward the Earth's center of mass, initially at 1g. This is a geodesic. It's the default, the equivalent of the straight line in Newton's first law. The ground is accelerating her up at 1g to compensate by pushing on her with an upward force due to its rigidity, forcing her away from that geodesic so she doesn't fall as she otherwise would have. Whether this extremely counterintuitive way of looking at this seems reasonable or not is irrelevant to the following. It describes the motion of a falling body or a body resting on the ground in a way that is, in the examples we've looked at so far at least, mathematically equivalent to Newton's law of gravity. It's just a hell of a lot more complicated. So what's the point? Why would anyone in their right mind do something that's equivalent to something else except it's a hell of a lot more complicated? Well, like I've said, it's equivalent in the examples that we've covered so far. In other situations, it's not. Consider what happens if Bob is in a very large spaceship. These two balls will appear to move toward each other as the ship freely falls toward the Earth, because their geodesics point in different directions. But why would they? Well, in general relativity, the way this is interpreted is as an indication that gravity doesn't just curve space-time, but also space itself. This means that a beam of light, which follows a straight line through space, and we're talking about space now, not space-time, will travel a longer distance through curved space as seen by an outside observer than by an observer within that curved frame of reference even if both observers are freely falling inertial observers. Since they're both inertial observers, they will agree on the speed of light, because as we learn from special relativity, the speed of light in vacuum is invariant in all inertial frames. So they must disagree about how much time has passed. This is called gravitational time dilation and means that a clock ticks slower on the surface of the Earth, where space and space-time are more curved, than far out in space where it's less curved. This prediction is not made by Newton's theory, and yes, the empirical evidence is in, it's how nature behaves. GPS works by comparing clocks in orbit with clocks on the ground, and the clocks must be synchronized for it to give an accurate position. In order to keep the clocks synchronized, the time dilation must be compensated for. If gravity didn't slow down time, that compensation would instead throw the clocks more out of sync, rendering GPS completely useless. Another consequence of general relativity is gravitational redshifting. A beam of light will be drawn out as it moves out of a gravitational field, precisely because time flows faster outside it. Its wavelength increases. It gets redshifted. A beam of light moving in the opposite direction will get blue shifted instead. These effects have also been measured experimentally on numerous occasions and are also not predicted by Newton's theory. Yet another interesting prediction of general relativity is gravitational lensing. A beam of light left to its own follows a straight line through space, but the presence of mass will turn that straight line into a curve, remember? 
so gravity will affect light even though it has no mass. Images like these show this effect in a pretty spectacular way. The distortions are a result of light from objects in the background being lensed in the gravitational fields of galactic clusters in the foreground. General relativity is also required if we want to correctly predict planetary orbits close to stars, where the star's gravity is strong enough to curve spacetime significantly. Einstein's first test of general relativity was to apply it to Mercury's orbit, and he found that his theory correctly predicted the precession of its perihelion, something Newtonian gravity does not. A final thing I'd like to mention is that general relativity, unlike Newtonian theory, predicts the existence of gravitational waves, distortions of spacetime that propagate at the speed of light that are produced when massive bodies orbit each other and spiral in toward each other. Einstein expected that this distortion would be so small that it wouldn't ever be measured, but turns out he was wrong about that. Gravitational waves produced by a pair of black holes merging were measured directly in 2015, and several more observations of the phenomenon have been made since then. What all this means is that we can usually regard gravity as a force, but not always. Newtonian physics is a good enough approximation for most engineering applications. But it is an approximation. It has limits beyond which it simply doesn't work, most notably in astrophysics. In other words, no one's lying, and gravity is very much real. Flurfs simply don't want to understand, because as long as they don't understand, they can maintain their delusion of having outsmarted all of us who have been brainwashed by NASA's satanic propaganda. They're wrong. They know they're wrong. And they want to be wrong. See ya.